I to introduce Marshall Van Alstyne. Uh, Marshall got his bachelor's degree in computer science at Yale. He got his master's and his PhD at MIT in the Sloan School of Management in the Information Sciences. Uh, he's now a faculty member at Boston University and a visiting <coughs> professor at MIT, so he spent some of his time there and some of the time on the other side of the uh, Marshall has received a career award from the National Science Foundation uh, from, uh, and award, other awards as well from both uh, programs in my directorate, IOS and IIS, among others. He's served on panels, including in SIDES and in SDE. His work has been published in Science, in Management Science, in the Strategic Management Journal, and in a slightly more popularized version, uh, a journal called The Economist Voice, which highlights kind of uh, economist writing to a more general population. Uh, his research in general is about understanding markets for information. So how do you price information? How does information create a market? How does information uh, destroy markets? And the interface in general between information and computer science and economics. And uh, we're delighted to have him. I should add that Marshall has some time in his schedule between 2.30 and 4, where he's going to be in a conference room uh, in size, 11.20, right? 11.20, and uh, so anyone who wants to come and speak with him then and talk about research or things that he's doing or other issues are more than welcome to stop by. So I've known Marshall for uh, a long time, since graduate student days, and uh, I'm delighted to see him again in the building, and uh, we're delighted to see him here, and I hope you'll join me in welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'm going to date the age here, you know, different times we've known each other. Um, I like to move around a little bit, so I'm going to move, you know, these tables seem to separate us from another, so I can't move, I can't give the talk and then move around at the same time. So we'll move this out so that I can actually interact with you, right? Because I'd much rather make this interactive. Uh, I'm usually pretty good at managing the time and keeping things on schedule as long as I can see a clock, which we have over here. So, um, you know, the talk is really going to be on applications of information economics to questions of fighting fraud, why does that matter? How can we use it to solve a number of different problems? Can we take kind of social or economic mechanism design perspective to solving some of these questions? Um, I really do want to invite you to ask me questions en route rather than just saving them until the very end to get more discussion going. So the first half of this talk is really going to be on completed research. As a matter of fact, the first portion of this is already published. And then the benefit of interaction is going to be I'm going to get to learn from you as I work on the next portion of this research going forward as we do a design framework and actually look at some new ways of looking at some of these problems. Uh, so I'll I invite your questions. I want to, do, uh, to get those in. If I'm not getting enough of them, I'll start asking you questions along the way. <laughs> okay? So with that, um, I also want to acknowledge my uh, co-conspirators in this research. We've got a couple of wonderful graduate students, uh, Dawei Shen of Media Lab, <coughs> Rick Wash from University of Michigan, um, Marco DiMaggio in the economics part at MIT, all helping different portions of this research, uh, in particular some of the uh, antiviral and, and spam fighting properties of economics, and then some of the tools we've been building up at the Media Lab, and then some of the econometric analyses we've been doing uh, on some of the data. Well, if we're going to go after the question of fighting fraud, ought we not start with the definition of what fraud is? It's really simple. Fraud is simply deception for purposes of gain. Now this actually has at least two elements it gives us leverage on. Anyone want to take a shot at what that, I mean with such a short definition you think there may not be a lot there, but anyone want to take a shot at least what two ways this might give us a way of tackling this kind of a problem? Oh, you're raising your hand? <laughs> I told you I'm going to ask you guys questions. Right? You're waving hi, all right. All right, well, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll invite the victims because they come in late. As a professor, right, when my students come in late, I usually ask them the first question to introduce the case, right? So we'll do it that way. We'll, we'll let, you off the, let you off the hook on that. All right. A definition this short actually will give us at least two ways of dealing with the problem. One of them is a little bit more obvious, which is for purposes of gain. It, trustworthy systems always have this interesting problem that it's almost never possible to get perfect protection. So the idea of, a, in this case of gain, if we can do a cost-benefit analysis, then maybe we can make the gain not worth it, so fraud isn't worthwhile. So one of the elements here for applying economics is going to be uh, purposes of gain. The other part of it, however, is often one that's left out, which is deception. Deception is one party misrepresenting the truth, misrepresenting the true state of affairs. That opens up an entire suite of tools for information economics on information asymmetry. One party knows something, one party does not. 
And so those are the tools we're going to actually try to apply as well as the tools for cost-benefit analysis to see if we can actually cause benefit and gain. So that's going to be the portion of it um, as we go through. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some work where we actually try to use an economic approach to something you'd all be familiar with, which is solving the spam problem, but then also try to go underneath it and not just address what shows up in your mailbox, but also see is there a way some of these mechanism designs can be applied underneath to go get not just cleaning up the filters, but possibly also getting at the root problem? Is there a way to, to make it harder for folks to send spam in the first place as opposed to just catching it on the back end? See if we can actually go after some of those things as well. So um, I know that you see XKDC. It's a wonderful technology cartoon. I particularly love this one. It's a nice way insight in this. He says, you know, starting this, crypto nerd's imagination for solving problems here is, the laptop's encrypted. Let's build a million dollar cluster cracker to crack, um, cracker to crack it. So no good, it's 4096 bit RSA. Blast, our evil plan is foul. So that's the crypto imaginist the engineer's version of the problem alone. Then he says, in the real world, okay, actually, the laptop's encrypted. Drug him, hit him with his $5 wrench until he tells us a password. Got it, <laughs> right? Again, it's kind of a social mechanism design issue, you know, where this is, you know, $5 password as opposed to multi-million dollar network to solve the problem. Maybe there's a way around that. So. Let's start with that as a kind of insight that we're going to try to capitalize on uh, to try to build the system. Another thing I want to go through is I want to look at someone else's definition of trusted, trustworthy system. Um, this is actually a definition that showed up in code, and it's not Larry Lessig's definition. This came from someone who's much more sophisticated about trustworthy systems per se. But there's a nice reason that Lessig uses this definition, which is um, you know, and so we'll start with it. You know, the transaction itself has to be authenticated. You need to know whom you're dealing with. Um, authorized, they have to have permission to do what they're doing. Are, are they taking money? Should they be sending you spam? Are they getting the transaction? Does the transaction happen with high integrity? Are you getting the good that you thought you were getting? Are getting communications that you thought you were getting? Is it private? So you know, can you keep it free from special and nosy folks? And the person get it? Can they not? repudiate that they actually got it. So did they receive the package? Did they get the communication? Whatever. Lessig has this wonderful larger context, which is he's a constitutional law scholar. So he wants to ask, what's the architecture of the system, the environment within which you want to live? So he takes a trustworthy system and says, well, all of this can be governed by code. And we can code this in, and you can design the mechanism. You can make the system work differently depending on the principles you architect into the system. So that's the starting point. That's where we want to go. Can we design this? And I'll come back to that toward the end after visiting this one problem on spam and viruses. So here's we're going to start with spam and viruses. So here's a simple punchline for it. Let me see if I can walk you through the intuition. Uh, this is again, this is prior research. It's already published. We make one pretty strong claim in that a mechanism that's a market mechanism based in economics can actually give users more value than a perfect filter with no false positives and no false negatives. Pretty strong claim. Because there's no way that we're going to, if we say a perfect filter is one that has no false positives and no false negatives on spam, right? There's no way you can do better than that because you've already identified all the false negatives and false positives. So let me give you the intuition, and then I'll walk you through the logic of how we're going to make it happen and make it actually work. Spam, think of it in economic equivalent. Spam is almost like country at the border saying, I refuse all trade of the following type. It's almost a quota system. It's as if a person at one end has said, I refuse all of the goods of the following type because they're, for me, they're bad, I don't want them. On the other end, we've known since kind of Econ 101, you can almost always improve total value if you can make both parties better off and trade and actually arrive at a, mutual, a mutually beneficial transaction. So imagine the two the following scenario. Someone who's an advertiser wants to buy a moment of your time. They're trying to sell you a Blackberry. They're trying to sell you, you know, a sale over at Target, right? They want to buy a moment of your time. What might previously have you considered a waste, well, for enough right price, actually, OK, you're willing to listen. Or another one, let's take it, this is Washington, DC. Politicians want to get their messages to you all the time. So is it, is it possible for them to reach you in a way that's value adding for you and for them? If you can do that, then instead of having a simple quote at the border, in effect, what's happened is they've made you better off in some sense by sharing the value that they have in communicating with you with you. That's what the mechanism is intended to do. Okay? So that's the intuition. So with that, this you know, just characterizing the problem, um, just data on it, estimated yearly losses are uh, you know, individual it's supposed to go up to like 50 billion in terms of either lost productivity or cost that companies in, you know, incur. 
um, Federal Can Spam Act was enacted. Uh, I'm sorry, that was supposed to be 2004. It got got globally replaced, so that's 2004 and 2000. But there was almost no impact on the reduction of spam after that was enacted. Um, it, you know, colossal fraction of all the communications in the background actually is spam. Your filters are actually been weeding a lot of that out. One critical point here is that the vast majority of it is sent by zombies. It's people's infected machines, and they don't even know they're infected, right? So. Uh, is it going to be, that's going to be an interesting problem of it. Another interesting element here is that it wasn't even the consensus definition in the same internet report. It, um, it depends on whom you ask. They get different versions of what constitutes spam. You know, more than 90% of people think that adult you know, uh, porn is spam. Um, political religious stuff, well, interestingly enough, 74 folks think 70, you know, political communications can actually be spam. Um, that's interesting because if politicians want to reach you, well, then a fair amount of that would have been blocked by a filter. Right? So that's an interesting point. Uh, versus charities, and you know, some people come at that might be NPR soliciting, so that's another such communication. Or even with prior business relationship, which is allowed by law, they can continue marketing to you. They'll even 32% of people think that is spam. So that's another interesting variation in the definitions. And without a consistent definition, it's really hard for a filter to, to get that exactly right. Um, I want to walk you just for fun some of the difficulties of how a computer might have trouble doing this. How many of you had to solve a CAPTCHA to log into something? Right. Yeah, this is the computer, um, you know, computer te te automated test to tell computers and humans apart. A uh, guy at CMU helped devise these things. So they're making us all do work. It's interesting that the spammers have inverted the test on people, and now what they're doing is they're actually offering porn in order to get people to solve the CAPTCHAs in order they can then go break into the system. So they, they flip the whole notion of outsourcing the problem. It's really kind of interesting. Um, here are other. So here are other examples of, I want to demonstrate for you how difficult it is for technology alone to solve these problems. And I'm going to give you several metaphors that are not in there. So I want to say, where is you know, Viagra going to appear in anything that I'm going to show you, or a word for a naughty body part? None of that's going to be in any of the stuff I'm going to show you. But OK, it's risque enough, so I just want to give you know, fair warning. Uh, there, there are no, uh, you know, uh, no grammar school children in here. OK, here's one. Get a rod like a fire hose. That went straight through my spam filters. And it's a great metaphor. You know exactly what they're talking about, but it's a metaphor. The computer isn't going to pick that up. Another one was, keep your flower firm. Right? There's another example of that. Again, it's a metaphor. So you know what is being said, but it's being said indirectly. So trying to go through the standard routes. But this one, I give these guys credit because they were sending a comedy. So, um, this is a guy at his bedside, and all the cats are standing here like with their tails up. and said, that's odd. This bottle of Viagra was full two days ago. <laughs> right? So they're actually, this was, this was clever enough. You actually wanted to read this. This was funny. <laughs> right? So this was a gift. I, you know, I was happy to receive that one. That was, I, I thought that was a big laugh. <laughs> right? So in order to make any headway on anything, just as with fraud, it helps to start with a def good definition. What is spam? In an economic sense, it's really easy to describe. It's a kind of pollution. It's information pollution. It's garbage someone's dumping into your mailbox that you don't want, but they'd rather put it in there for you to have it. Right? Pollution has a number of interesting properties, and there are a number of interesting solutions to them. The most common are things like, um, all right, so it, it's just message pollution in this case. So what are pollutions for it? The most common approaches to uh, pollution are filters. Right? You clean up the effluent of the smokestack. That's exactly what's happening in most spam inboxes. Another one is regulation. All right, You regulate the people who produce it. So we've got the Federal Can Spam Act. But one that's often overlooked is the Coast Theorem, handling an externality. Pollution is an externality. right? So if someone's dumping garbage, it's creating a bad that someone else is having to deal with. Often. Externalities can also be good, by the way. You guys fund research. That creates wonderful positive externalities. It's great that other people have access to that. Research is underproduced because it needs to be funded. It's a public good. So for goods with positive externalities, they're underfunded. For goods with uh, negative externalities, like pollution, they're overproduced because the people who are creating them aren't bearing those costs. So those are the things that we're actually trying to deal with. So the Coast term has this observation that for externalities, it's a missing market. If you sign property rights in that good, then you can trade it and achieve an efficient solution. Right? And in general, it doesn't matter how you sign the property rights if trading is efficient, but it does matter if transactions costs are high. 
the transactions costs are high for negotiation. As you know, what are the transactions costs of negotiating over a single mesh? It's, it's a real pain in the butt. You don't want to do that. If they're high, what you do is you sign property rights or your liability to the low cost avoider. So you want to make someone liable for the damage that they're creating, and then you can internalize that. They will internalize their costs and will produce less of the waste. We do the exact same thing. What we're going to do is we're going to say the people producing the waste should actually be the ones cleaning it up. So uh, this is just an example of the Coach theorem. You won the Nobel Prize for it. It's a really elegant paper if you haven't seen it. It was done. Um, uh, it's called The Problem of Social Cost. It's an absolutely marvelous, very readable paper, um, and a very deep set of insights in how you manage these public goods externalities problems. Um, the original context was interfering radio spectrum. One radio broadcast was interfering with the broadcast of another one, which is creating an externality, messing up the signals. And so again, the idea was then property rights in radio spectrum. So you had certain bandwidths which you could apply, and then trading in that, and you're making an efficient market solution. We have the exact same thing in cap and trade. There's another element of that same thing. Here's an example of why economics matters so much to security systems for solving fraud problems. Okay. This is an example of it's a really nice paper done by Anderson on why crypto systems fail. And here the insight is that the US and the, U and the UK had identical technology ATM for presenting, preventing fraud. But the liability had been placed in different parties. In the United States, it's the case that if there's a fraudulent transaction on your statement, the bank is liable um, unless they can prove you were responsible for it. In the UK, it's the exact opposite. In the UK, if there's a fraudulent statement on the trend on your um, balance, you are responsible for it unless you can prove the bank is at fault. Who has an easier time making that with a burden of proof? They're the ones keeping all the records. They're the ones that have the transactions. They're the ones that have the spy cameras on the ATMs. How easy is it for you to actually make that claim? Much harder for you to make that claim. So the implication then is, which in which country is the fraud rate higher? It's in the UK. In fact, it's dramatically higher in the UK. The only difference is not the technology. It's who's liable for the damage, right? And UK, US got this one right. UK got it wrong. It's a great application of the Coase theorem. Good question. OK, all right. Um, so which, which party is better positioned to do this? Um, one of the reasons I want to argue why the current system is so bad, having people or institutions do all the spam filtering, it's analogous metaphorically to have every man, woman, and child have their own um, water filter or gas mask to purify their breathing air and their drinking water. That's a horrible waste. The burden should be placed on the people who are causing the problem, not the people who are suffering the problem. So what you want to do is create a um, in, in a sense, a, an attention right to push the burden back onto the party causing the problem rather than the other way around. Okay? So all we do is we actually say, there's a simple mechanism that we propose in, in this particular solution, which is effectively an attention bond. So if a stranger you've never heard from before, in this case says, I'm going to bet that you're going to want this message, um, then uh, that's a signal that they believe they're, sending, so that they're going to contact you with something valuable. If they're not willing to place that bet, then they reveal to you they're likely to waste your time. Because on that bet, it's simply like two cents, five cents, you would get to claim, you would get to keep that two cents or five cents if they were wasting your time from a total stranger. Spammers cannot afford that. The only way it's economically efficient for them is to give tens of thousands and one or two out of that actually do contract the deal. If tens of thousands are claiming two cents or five cents, they economically cannot afford it suddenly not worthwhile. All they do is if total strangers bets, this is interesting to you. If it's not, you get to keep my bet. right? If it's not, then it's refunded and they simply reuse it. That's the only mechanism. Okay? Um, so let me just give you a quick illustration to prove why it works. We've got two parties. We've got a sender and receiver. So all I'm going to do is say the sender's value is on this axis. So anything below here is negative. Anything above here is positive. Yeah? So if, if uh, such a large percentage of spam is being sent by robots, Hang on to that. Hang on to that. Okay? You're anticipating three slides, four slides from now. Okay? <laughs> so initially it should be the case. You would think, right. So the question is if my grandmother has an account and her machine is uninfected and she's not capable of being sysadmin, is she then going to bear this huge cost of spam bond being sent to her account? Hang on to that. Great question. 
So um, that's, yeah, that's the zombie question. All right. And let me start with just an observation that um, I want to prove to you that you can actually do better with such a me mechanism. And there's a whole bunch of integral equations behind it. But I'll give it to you graphically. It's very simple. Okay. Two parties. So we'll have two axes. All right. We've got sender on this axis, receiver on this axis. Positive value is this way for the sender. Positive value is this way for the receiver. And everything above cost, and this would be the cost line for the receiver of processing mail, and this is the cost line for the sender of the, and it could be zero, I don't care, I can move this axis anywhere I want. All I need is positive above this, it's going to get sent. Uh, so messages are sent anytime the value to the sender is greater than the cost to the sender, and there's going to be that huge area there. Notice that is what the perfect filter would exclude, because this is what's sent and what's wanted. So that's the limited area of a perfect filter. So it's positive to this guy and positive to that guy, that's just that tiny quadrant there. Okay. Um, on the other hand, there's this huge bulk of crud that will show up. Um, vote for this, aggressive marketing, you know, phishing scams. All this stuff is in this region here that you really don't want, right? So you can see how it's characterized. Over here is unsent mail because it was too costly to send. Ironically, there are actually things you might want to get that aren't sent. This could be a personalized loan application where they need your data first, or maybe it could be some customized news just for you, right? You need to put in some stuff into the system in order to do it, otherwise they don't have, they don't know. It's too costly for them to just go fish that out. Um, in theory, there's also the stuff that's not, that's you know, unwanted and not sent. That might be accidentally slipping and telling your boss what you really think. Um, right? Uh, yes. Question. So I can see where the cost to send might be the same for a whole array of charges, but isn't the cost to receive somewhat dependent on who's doing the receiving? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know what? There's a hidden slide in here. Turns out, I can actually show you, it makes not one whit of difference. Um, here's a hidden slide, I'll see if I can show this one. I can change the probability distributions in this any way I want. I can grow them. I can um, I can change the probability density in here. You can see from the animation, it isn't going to change the result at all. Right? Um, you, you, you're correct. Right? So you, you've anticipated a hidden slide there. Let me, let me go jump back to this. Um, <coughs> Now, from economics, we know the interesting thing. Total welfare, the reason for gain from trade, is the benefit to all the parties in society in this case. The benefit is going to be positive in this scenario. Anytime you get the, to the sum of these two values greater than zero, that happens to be northeast of this line here. So that's this region up here. Anything here is, social, is positive social value, right? So that's the stuff you would like to have happen in communication. So all of that is stuff that would be what you want. All of this below here is what you don't want. So the ideal system, the perfect system, would capture all of this and discard all of this because all of this has positive social value. So the question is, effectively, how did you make that happen? And the perfect filter gives you only this. And the stuff that we propose actually recaptures a great portion of this. And in some cases, if you can allow reverse direction, also recaptures a bunch of this. So that's the intuition. For those of you that are interested in such things, this is the stuff we all have a bunch of integrals. I won't, I won't spend time on that in, in this talk. I, I mean, I'm very happy to if you want to. But uh, oh, someone wants to spend time on the integrals. Yes. Well, not, not on the integrals, but on the previous slide. So the, yeah. yellow, the yellow territory, you're saying that the positive values in one party outweigh the negative values. That's correct. Yeah. That's the trade. That's the politician who wants to buy your time. Or this is the personalized loan that you would actually really like to get because you can lower your rate if you know whom to contact and you can give them the right information. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Question in the back. Um, it's not a question, it's a comment. Oh. No, sorry, none of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Since you brought up, since you used the term social welfare, I yeah. think it's probably important for the audience to know this concept. This is weighting the benefit to the sender equally to the benefit to the receiver. That is correct. That is correct. It is one definition of social welfare. A more careful definition would be the total economic surplus weighting the surplus to the sender equal to the surplus to receiver. I, I realize that that sounds almost circular, but one of the things that happens if you work with this concept in economics that this is based on, social <coughs> welfare has a lot of meanings in plain English that are not in this mathematical definition. So I don't yeah, want I to think that. we've mathematically that. proven no. that this is a social well, no, no, hold on a second. The last part I will disagree with. The last part I'll adamantly disagree with. So here's the way I would do that, all right? Analogous to his question, what I would do is 
reweight it any way you wish. If you reweight those, what you'll do is you'll shrink or expand one axis relative to the other axis, which is a density plus. But that's only applying in social welfare in the broad sense. It's somehow or other a it's somehow or other calculated as a weighted sum of the gains to the two parties in this that are on your graph. Well, I'll, you know, you, you take the integral to all the parties in right. the whole society. Over the whole yeah. society. But let's take the classic application of the same social welfare concept to antitrust policies. And sure. we have a merger that the Department of Justice just filed a lot yesterday. Mm -hmm. One of the, since they said it's closed case, yeah. we can consider that set of issues, what mergers are good or bad for society. But in that broader concept of social welfare, if I were a lawyer, which I am not, I would also be talking about concentration of economic power, how that affects what kinds of messages get sent in the broader society. Let me, Who hears what? Okay. And that's, again, I will, I'm an economist, so I'm fine with this, but I'm, yeah, I want I'm, people to know that you're not, this isn't quite saying we've shown that this is where society should go without taking any other consideration. Um, Again, I'm going to disagree with that, but I'll, let me take that discussion offline afterwards. Okay. And the reason I'm going to disagree with that is uh, to be very careful about what you mean by utility in this case. So, and, I, and I don't want to restrict it to simple financial utility. It can be anything that makes people happy. Well, of course it's like the, one thing that, the, the one thing where it gets tricky, and I will acknowledge, is um, all of these models assume your happiness over the condition of someone else's happiness is not considered in there. So things like abortion rights are things not considered necessarily in those kinds of models, but that's a much broader political discussion. Yeah, we can have that so let me, let me take that one later. In general, I think um, in general, I think these models are much more robust than most of the critiques are leveled at them once you understand the variety of the meanings of the variables. I would agree with that, but I also think one problem that economists have is how we, because I am one, yeah. use that phrase is we frequently throw it around in a way where we are not That's correct. That's not the same, that may not do the same thing as what your mother needs when she says social welfare. That, okay, that, that's true. That may be true. Um, the other element of this is um, the beauty of this tight technical definition is it then allows you to make very strong statements within the scope of that technical Absolutely. definition, which is what you really can do. So Absolutely. one of the things I want to emphasize is a lot of what we try to do is go very precise definitions <laughs> as with the definition for fraud in order that we can make real progress on how to change it in a meaningful way. So that I will definitely agree with. All right. With that, let me see. Uh, I'm going to move past the intervals. OK? Now, thank you for your question. All right? So, <laughs> right? This is, suppose 65% of spam is sent by infected zombies, and my grandma thinks the solution sucks, right? Because all of a sudden, she is out of a lot of money that um, she wouldn't otherwise have to spend, I think. Now, let me start with a different question. How many of you in the room carry a credit card? Or best differently, I see who's asleep. Who doesn't carry a credit card? Yeah, ah, all right, got one. Oh my goodness, all right. <laughs> or even, um, now, of you that have got a credit card, have any of you had it stolen? Ah, oh, I see several folks. Well, I've had it, okay. Have you personally had to pay the full liability of the credit card? Correct. Why not? Why not? Credit card pays it. What's that? The credit card pays it. The credit card company pays it. The credit card company pays for it. Federal law limits liability. So it's yes, it's actually the original was was proxmire legislation. The original was proxmire legislation, but that limits them. The by law, it's actually fifty dollars. But most credit card companies exceed that, and they give you zero fraud liability. Why? Yeah, they want to use any Bingo. <laughs> That's it. They need you to carry it. They want your business. Why? They want your business because you give them so much value in transacting with them. Again, it's a trade. They give you the liability insurance. So let's answer your question, OK? In economic terms, the problem is moral hazard. Someone's computer is actually doing damage to other people, and they're not taking responsibility for it. They may not even necessarily be aware of it. There are ways of getting them to internalize the cost or other actually have some benefits to it. Um, not bearing the cost, they're infecting machines, creating insu uh, they're insufficiently motivated to clean them up, or they may not even be able to clean them up. Okay, So they may not be motivated, they may not be able. So we need some kind of fraud protection analogous to 
credit card companies. It's really simple. We do the same thing. There is so much value to having all of this transaction volume take place through a particular ISP. When engineered, when the mechanism is designed properly, the ISP gets so much value, they want to give you the insurance in exactly the same way the credit card company does. They indemnify you to get the, in order to get your business. Now my grandmother doesn't have to actually have the credit card to worry about the liability because it's assumed. This has an enormous number of benefits. Let me show you. First of all, it's botnet detection. Why is it they can send the spam in the first place? You don't know what's there. The immediate thing that happens with a system like this is all of a sudden you've got a trail. Your statement shows up and says, wait a second. I've been billed for all these spam bonds that I never paid for. I don't know these people, right? So immediately it surfaces the infection in a way, it shines some light on it in a way you didn't know before. So now you've got a mechanism to detect it once it's there. Better, something else happens as well. We've shifted the liability. Now the liability is on the ISP. Well, who's got better position to clean it up? In the ISP, not my grandmother. We've moved it exactly as an ATM fraud case. We've moved the liability to a party who can clean it up. So not only have we detected the infection and we created benefit for the users, we put the responsibility onto parties who can do something about it. Okay? So we get enormous benefits from shifting to an economic mechanism where someone can actually take care of it. So we, we just you know derive a set of equations, the one that all makes sense so that everyone wins in such a system in order to create value. So that's the basic mechanism. Um, this one has a slight difference that the ISP will ask you to comply with a certain guidance. That is correct. Could you repeat the question? Yes. Okay. So, so it, no, but this is interesting. In order for the ISP to clean your machine, you will have, in effect, had to have given them rights to do so. This is exactly what should happen. If you want to, if you're a sysadmin and you want to maintain your own machine you're entirely at liberty to deny them that right, in which case they deny you the liability protection. Or, so you then assume responsibility, and you then do it. Or, that, yeah, that's correct. Yes? So you also have shut down the US software, or shut down the software industry, uh, because ISPs are not going to allow in installation of any software except the, the software that they know and understand. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure I would agree with that. I'm pretty sure that you could actually go through iTunes and go through other systems to actually make it happen. It, they would actually probably want to clean some of the software you, you would be downloading. And actually, pieces of that might actually be a good thing. You're going to have fewer folks, you know, when my kids are going across the internet and downloading stuff to play games, it might actually be a good thing if the stuff that they're downloading is checked before it's downloaded. For people that are not qualified to judge whether or not it's safe. You want someone who's making that judgment who actually would know to be able to do that. Okay? Um, so I, I just want to go through a quick list of some, um, and boy, we're actually we're getting a little bit longer, some interesting questions on here. This is just a quick list of some of the economic mechanisms you can use to make these kinds of decisions <coughs> in order to actually shift the burden in order to get better performance out of here. Um, there are different ways of thinking about it. Opportunity cost, right? If there's some Romanian malware programmer, earning 100K from malware, well, you can either cut their wages by making it less successful for them or give them opportunity on something else. It shifts them into another line of, of business. Externalities, this is the stuff of managing the Coast Theorem. That was the stuff I just walked you through. How do you manage the externalities? See if it's a negative externality or if it's a positive externality. The solution is to get the party causing the externality to internalize it. That's what intellectual property rights do for positive externalities. They get to capture the benefits, the spillover, right? That's what pollution trading rights do for negative externalities. Directionalities use a Coase theorem to solve that problem and get some improvement. Information asymmetry is the set of mechanisms used to solve a problem when one party knows something and one party doesn't. Fraud is this case simply defined. Deception in pursuit of gain. Deception is one party knows the truth of the matter and another party doesn't and has been misrepresented to them. So use principles of information asymmetry, bonding, warranties, uh, signals, screens, those kinds of things to actually separate truth from falsity. It's a great way to actually make significant progress without having to rely solely on technological means alone. That would, network effect is another way of solving these kinds of problems. Anytime you're creating standards, two-sided networks are very powerful in actually causing new standards to be adopted. So if you need a new standard to solve these kinds of problems, if you need the same currency transactions, you can actually, again, use these mechanisms to 
um, solve the chicken and egg problem. No one wants to produce the standard until others have adopted it. No one wants to adopt it until there's enough content available on it. So you can use those mechanisms to make all those things happen. Just this broaden the arsenal of tools applied to the fraud problem. Economics has a great set of tools and mechanism design to help address some of these kinds of issues. So this is just, just that summary before I move on to the next set of topics, um, see if we can actually do something. So uh, another interesting area, is there any questions on that before I move to another space of topics? I'm not going to have as much time as I might have liked to actually cover it. Yeah? Well, uh, because of the ones that we find, but the question is So I'm the first thing that you need an estimate of this problem. Yeah. So are you doing, have you done something to figure it out? How much, what would be the estimate of the cost of this spam? Oh, absolutely, that, absolutely. Otherwise, yeah. this whole thing is meaningless. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And actually, um, I haven't done the, no, the numbers for the cost of standards, but there's a great deal of research on the actual redemption, the actual, uh, exact redemption rates of spammers. Uh, the preponderance of spam, Thinny is doing work on that, Symantec is doing work on that. There are a lot of organizations that actually can give you those, uh, those precise numbers uh, to do that. But, but I agree you'd want to set, in order to set those correctly, you'd actually want to figure out what those, uh, what the exact numbers are. Okay, um, the next thing I want to do is then introduce knowledge marketplaces, because one of the things I want to do is, again, promote lots of information transactions. The creation of new information, the dissemination of new information, gathering information from diverse sources. The problem, of course, is that markets almost always introduce fraud. So the, the broader research agenda is to create value through creating information marketplaces. And I want to give you examples of fraud that has taken place in these markets and some of the ways we're trying to address them, okay? So some of these are just fun. Many of you have seen the prediction markets, right? These capture disaggregated information uh, in ways of making forecasts about elections that are usually more accurate than the opinion polls. Um, they cast the last several presidential elections more accurately than opinion polls, and in Massachusetts, they forecast the Brown Coakley uh, election ahead of the opinion polls. A really nice example of, of capturing decentralized information. Um, Google flu trends predicted flu outbreaks, um, you know, 10 days to two weeks ahead of the Center for Disease Control. How do they do it? Well, the Center for Disease Control picks it up from doctors' reports, but uh, people are keying their flu symptoms long before they ever get a doctor's visit. I don't know about you guys, the last time I tried to get a doctor's appointment, it was several weeks away, right? So they're able to pick that up a little bit earlier. Interestingly enough, notice that it is uh, forgeable. This is correlation where that doctor's visit is causation. So interestingly enough, after the news story broke, everyone was keying in, so it looks like there's this massive flu outbreak. Or if you wanted to harness a botnet, you could actually go search in like, you know, terms like, you know, Sarah Palin and wardrobe, and you can actually cause it to make it look like people are interested in that. So be careful to distinguish between causation versus correlation. Again, it's a way of uh, watching for those broad instances. Um, CIRMO is a fascinating market that was created by a doctor um, for deception from Merck. Merck was hiding the fact that Vioxx was causing heart attacks. He wanted greater information exchange among doctors crossing boundaries so they could pick that up earlier. So if you're a doctor in Boston, you could ask a doctor in uh, Mannheim or California, are they observing any symptoms uh, or any consequences of this? It's a great way of creating information exchange uh, across different communities. Um, also, forecasting markets are being used at um, you know, Bank of America, at Google. Uh, HP claims that they're actually able to forecast semiconductor sales better with one of these markets than the managers of those divisions. Right? There's often information asymmetry there, but what's really known. Also, interestingly enough, Bank of America claims to get better forecasts of economic activity than the U.S. government. Why? Because they observe your credit card transactions at a really fine grain level, right? So they get it ahead of the government, uh, actually capturing interesting data that way. Here's an idea market that was done at Princeton that was quite interesting. They figured how to spend. So, so how, how can you explain the stock market failure recently? Well, you're going to ask me to solve all these social problems in one talk? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> You know, um, well, you know, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, banks, let's just put it this way. Banks were aware of problems before the government. Let's put it that way. That may be one of the reasons why they're taking this or that action. In the same way that Ken Lay knew more about Enron than he was telling the stockholders. Banks had leading indicators relative to government because of their, the fine-grained, real-time nature of their data. Whereas for governments, aggregated ex post. So they, they do get leading indicators. Um, the interesting thing about this is that the, um, uh, Princeton student government actually 
Um, we're trying to figure out how to spend their budgets. So they gener the elected officials generated their top 100 ideas. They submitted to a student vote. The students got to add their own ideas. The cool result there was that three of the top five ideas were not anticipated by the elected student officials. It's a really cool result that they're actually getting more diverse ideas and buck percolating them up. It's crowdsourcing uh, at its best in an interesting way. Um, my favorite example of a working knowledge market is actually SAP, where if you, um, it's the developer ecosystem, where suppose, right, suppose you're a developer for SAP and you have a question, you can ask a question of another developer and earn points in exchange for um, uh, that it, providing a good answer. You'll get points in proportion to the quality of the answers that you give. It's fascinating because um, not only are the, you're getting 30 minute average response time from one another as opposed to one business day from SAP, so they like it. The developers like it so much. These are the points earnings. I don't know if you can see it. These are the names of people, and these are their points earnings. You can use these points as true signals of expertise. You can look here for someone who's a Python programmer active in Afghanistan in the last two weeks. I mean, you can actually do very fine grain search, but you know it's accurate because you've earned those points. You can actually signal the expertise. It's a really interesting way of doing information exchange. Um, and so it's a, it's a nice thing that, S, that, and it, um, that SAP has done. It's also causing information to be pushed out in the market for the benefit of everyone. Previously, a value-added reseller would have kept all their information close to the desk because they want to be better than their competitors. And um, now, they're going in and answering other people's questions to demonstrate that they're better than the competitor. And now the information is available to everyone. You got a question? Who determines how many points to award for uh, how good an answer? That's a great question. Um, in this case, I actually think it should be more crowdsourced. It tends to be the, the moderators, and they're limited to a range of one to 10 points. I actually think it needs to be a true market allowing more range of points um, in there, but that's a fine question. I actually think it needs to be more in the market, in the market direction, but it's a hell of a stepping stone. They've done a really nice job of it. Um, this is a question answer exchange in Korea. Um, it's called Knowledge In or um, Kin. And it's interesting, here you can see you get more and better, and this is different categories. These can be law, finance, and it can be baby names, movies, uh, songs, <laughs> uh, computer technology, and these are different categories. The more points you offer, the more answers you tend to get, right? So it tends to pull information into it. One other thing that's really nice here is they recognize the positive spillover externalities in here. If you add commentary to someone else's answer to know what's a good answer, you can actually earn points. If the community, votes your answer the best one, you'll get a bonus of 10 points. Right? That's what should be happening. It's an information spillover. You've created a great answer that others can use. So if you've solved a finance problem or a law problem or a computer problem, you've created information wealth. And so they are subsidizing it with the award of additional points. That's what should happen. It's, a, an inst it's not recognized as such, but it is an instance of subsidizing the positive externality. It's a version of the coast, uh, applying the, the coast theorem. Okay? Um, uh, for what it's worth, we're actually doing some studies of this and whether or not these things work. Uh, work. We actually studied, uh, I'm going to jump over quickly again, we're going to run a little shy on time um, because we're asking good questions. We've actually been studying these things in the real world, in the wild. Um, this is an example of um, a knowledge market we studied with a Japanese bank where we could measure the output of loan officers. So the loan officer output is highly measurable. You know if it was successful loan, bad loan, and things like that. We had two years of transactional data where we can look at every single access to a question and answer market every time they downloaded the document. The cool finding about this was the one standard deviation rise in document used through the knowledge market is 11% rise in output. That's huge. It actually translates to 10 months of education. That's the productivity gain from use of the knowledge market. You get these information spillovers, you transfer expertise from the top to the bottom. So this is one of the outputs, ironically, this is NSF-funded research, by the way. Um, so this is some of the work going forward. This is now a paper that's just gone under review. But the nice thing is, and we've been studying these knowledge marketplaces to see if they create wealth, see if they create information wealth, see if they boost productivity. So that, that's just one slide from a much longer talk. Yeah. Does it take into consideration this, this, this wealth, product wealth, that some of these people may be doing this information exchange while being paid by somebody else, by doing it at work? The oh, loss. inside, okay, that's a great question. Inside the bank, they're all working for the same organization, so that doesn't matter. Um, at, at SAP is even a better example, because if, um, what you really, if you're very careful at setting the prices right, if you, set the, if you set the value too high, folks will shift away from their own work into helping other people and actually make, reduce the productivity. 
in which case you've now misallocated resources. So you must actually get the marginal. In effect, the rule is you must get the marginal rate of substitution accurate. So you'll need to statistically measure what the gains are and then set the prices right based on those gains. But that's, that's correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me get a, I'm going to give you uh, one other quick observation here. Having created a knowledge economy, we can actually then use more economic theory to even grow it further. So inside an organization like SAP or others, I can actually now start to introduce macro policy inside the firm so I can actually try to grow my knowledge economy. Um, I'll just jump through this, so I'm just going to jump through these quickly. This might be implementing monetary policy in the, in the US economy. This is implementing monetary policy inside the knowledge market that we've been running at MIT and at the Boston University in a place in Japan, I'm sorry, in um, France. This, by the way, is we subsidize the economy here. That's, I put an iPad up for auction and all of the students, the, the, all of a sudden the students went hog wild creating new knowledge. And there's another one over here, I put up other swag. I put up um, you know, t-shirts and I put up iTunes songs and created a new marketplace over here. And you can see the rise in economic activity that took place inside the knowledge market. The really cool result that we got was the value of the knowledge created inside the knowledge market was about one and a half, almost two times the value of the subsidy. So I was actually getting an information spillover that was greater than the value of the subsidy itself. And we can actually measure the size of that. It's a really cool use of a policy intervention to grow a knowledge economy for the benefit of the group. It's a really cool uh, set of results out of that. Um, but there's a problem. There's some really interesting things happen as a result. I mean, you won't be able to see this in the slides, but I'll, just, I'll go through them quickly. The iPad, going to this question of what, how much value, the iPad was too valuable. All of a sudden, the students got really creative about committing fraud in the marketplace. So we actually had to, so let's say the, the average value of the question might be 30 to 60 points. All of a sudden, someone would ask a stupid question you know, where's a good parking space and offer 800 points for it in order to launder and try to earn extra points, right? That wasn't a legitimate transaction. They're basically money laundering in order to earn points as fast as possible. Or in another case, we had a market here, they took entire textbooks, copyrighted, put them in the document market and sold them to each other, right? So they're trying to earn points in other fraudulent ways. We have to detect fraud. Go back to our, the goal is to create wealth. The goal is to create information. The goal is to cause these positive spillovers. But fraud follows wealth. So we need to see if we can introduce mechanisms to solve that kind of problem, okay? So it was interesting if this reemerged and it had to go back to this earlier research kind of question. Um, in Neighbor, for example, we've got the same kind of problem. All right, someone's interested in how this, uh, foot, this soccer star is doing. That's the question that's asked, but when someone answers it, they said, oh, I'm also interested. You can find out more about how he's doing uh, at this website. Well, it turns out this is, a, this is a sports separate site. Or another one, um, you know, you ask for wedding advice and someone says, oh, here's a travel planner. They're spamming. They're link spamming. It's, again, it's kind of deception. It's fraud for gain. Um, this is one. This is in New York Times, August 19th, fake reviews. When you guys are going to websites now, you can see folks, you might actually be reading Yelp and other stuff where they paid for their positive reviews. Again, it's fraud. It's misrepresentation of information. You should be using tools in information economics to solve those problems. Okay? Another one, um, crowdsourcing fraud detection. There's a really cool idea. Um, here's an instance of this. Facebook is looking at its problems. It's actually giving prizes and awards. This is um, August 31st. These examples happen all the time. This is August 31st. Pa Facebook is now paying up, um, you know, up to 40, you know, They've awarded something like 40 grand total to hackers who have tried to find bugs in their software. The crowdsourcing detection of the problems in here. The same idea can be applied more broadly. This is Bernie Madoff, um, right? The biggest fraudster in U.S. history, or possibly even all of history, $65 billion. A really nice proposal by an economist, crowdsourcing fraud detection here, to offload this problem from the, the SEC. Suppose. As, this, as they argue, individuals were to actually have a mechanism to report what it is that Madoff had told them in terms of their resource allocation, what they've earned. At the same time, they're getting other reports from the from Bernie Madoff's organization. Well, if these two don't reconcile, there's something you need to go look at, right? There's a problem. Whereas if they easily reconcile, then um, uh, then there's less of a problem. It's a way of trying to catch something earlier in some sense using one of these crowdsourcing mechanisms to do it. 
It's interesting, by the way, it helps to detect it. It still has a subtle problem in that it still it hasn't addressed the bottleneck problem. The SEC is now inundated with even more data, right? So I actually want to see if we can go after some of that a little bit and come back to computer science as a way to actually look at a few things like that. Um, okay. Um, let's see if this advances. Okay. This is another one I liked actually again from XKDC, right? Is it, again, it's mechanism design. Spammers are, you know, breaking traditional captures with artificial intelligence. So I built a new system. It asks users to rate and slate comments because constructive or not constructive. It has them reply with comments to which they're only rated by other users. And then she's asked, well, what do you do when spammers start offering useful comments? And it says, mission freaking accomplished. <laughs> right? They're actually doing useful work if they can actually solve that problem. It's a mechanism designed to actually get them to do something so that the benefit is there. Okay? Um, I want to go back to design an ecosystem and actually see if I can actually create an environment where everyone wins, see if we can actually solve some of those problems. problems. So just let's go back to computer science. I've only got, a two, I've only got five minutes left. I want to really race through this. You guys are asking lots of questions. So here's a simple spam fighting protocol, all right? As a simple example. We're actually trying to implement this in code in the knowledge market that we've just built, all right? So here's an accusation. The accuser gets notified of it, and they have a chance to fix it. The accuser is satisfied. The result is accepted. If there's no fix, then there's a decision procedure. This is a black box for the moment, okay? And then you get guilty or not guilty, and you apply the remedy. Okay, all the action has to happen here, right? What's the decision procedure, right, to detect and then correct fraud? All right, so here's, all right, here's one. At least three accusations with each reason, and they still haven't fixed it. Okay, here's one solution. The site admin votes guilty or not in. guilty, right? Any issues with the solution? I'll come back to computer scientists on this one. All right. Well, one nice thing is it's good detection. We've got lots of people crowdsourcing detection. That's like the solution for bringing that off. It's trustworthy. You've got a system who you, you know, you've endowed someone in this position to, with authority can actually make a decision. Any problems? Come <coughs> on, well, computer scientists. No scale, right? This guy is going to become a bottleneck. And also, what about appeals? Are you going to actually be able to do something like that? You may have to go back to the same person all over again. All right, all right, so let's modify this again. All right, now what we're going to do is at least three accusations. Now we're going to crowdsource. You randomly choose users who vote in your system, right? And you can even bootstrap them by, like, just like the CAPTCHAs, where you know, sometimes they don't, the computer doesn't know what the CAPTCHA is, so they'll offer a test CAPTCHA with the one that they do know what it is. So you can actually have test jurors in here, along with jurors that you do trust. You can bootstrap in here for guilty, not guilty, right? Apply, and you can apply different voting rules in here, plurality, majority, unanimity, you know, any of that's fine. The politics of that have already been pretty much worked out. And it does scale, right? Because now, you know, you don't, you don't have a single bottleneck here, okay? So you've got, you can now tap the whole community as a way to actually solve that. Uh, okay, how do you handle appeals in this case, right? Need a better authority. All right, let's try adapting it one more level, all right? Again, let's use computer science techniques for this as opposed to econ. Now I want is a recursive appeal procedure, all right? So appeal by either party is the case, so this is, you know, everyone's done a recursive algorithm, you know, is, here's, you start with the end test, right? Are you at the top? Well, if you're at the top, sorry, you're the Supreme Court, you're good out of luck, you can't go any further than that, okay? If you're not at the top level, okay, you can apply decision procedure N plus one in there, okay? And in this case, you have an nth degree juror. Nth degree juror earns a position as an N plus first degree juror after serving without judicial error for a specified number of decisions or value or what have you. And then it's just, you know, the absence of judicial depends on no appeals or decisions. If appealed, then the original decision stood, so it was legitimate. Or if it was overturned, then there was no obvious flaw in the logic as judged by a higher level judge. So now it's totally crowdsourced, totally scalable, and hopefully relatively trustworthy according to the criteria. And you can ding jurors along the way if they look as though they're deviating too much from the strategy. So it may be a way of actually dealing with this. There are a bunch of different design principles that I'd like to add to such a system. So these are just ways of thinking. And this is where I actually want your input. I'm actually thinking about this. Um, one minute, I, I want to finish the thought and then address your question. So these are just the questions and issues I'm thinking about and actually want your input because we're really trying to build a better system in here. Um, anonymity might be there but not free. So you know, then what you can do is cost-benefit analysis. What's the benefit in privacy? in terms of whistleblowing and detection, balance against increased probability of fraud. You can have for bounties, which reduces the false negatives undetected fraud, but you also need to deal with the 
um, unjust accusations, so you can actually have penalties of folks unjustly accused. So again, kind of a cost-benefit analysis. One thing about ratings and accusations is really kind of interesting. The New York Times article highlights folks can be paid to go rate stuff they haven't bought. Classic information asymmetry problem. Well, simply create a screen. Require them to have done the transaction before they can rate the transaction. We know that from information economics already, so we can use stuff like that. Angie's Lip and TripAdvisor suck in that sense because you don't have to engage in the transaction. Open table for restaurant, you have to have been to the restaurant and made the reservation in order to rate the restaurant. Much more reliable rating when you actually do that. Um, you do have to be aware in some of these crowdsourced things of possible bad equilibria where suppose some subgroup wants to trade illegitimate MP3 files. And then it's possible in a cultural sense that the judges you might have selected then might converge on, an, on the wrong equilibrium. And you will have to have some ways of breaking those kinds of things. So these are other problems we're trying to anticipate, uh, ways of doing that. Um, we want to be egalitarian. On, uh, we have some principles of generosity and forgiveness so that folks want to participate in the system. I want to show the two last thoughts is that mechanism design work. Many of you know the red balloon, the six balloon challenge. This was, a, I think this was sponsored by DARPA. Uh, the, um, you had their six balloons were placed all throughout uh, the United States, and the team that actually found them first won. This was a media lab team, and they used economic mechanism design. Not only did what they did is they recruited people via texting, but also they said, if you are a person who recruited a person that found it, you get a fraction of the reward. That motivated people to contribute. Economic mechanism design works. It's not just finding balloons. It's finding fraud. It's finding answers. Use the mechanism design to actually solve those kinds of solutions. The last thought I want to leave you with is that um, justness, fair reward, fraud elimination creates wealth. Um, this is a particular slide that I, that I created based on some research done on American Economic Review. Um, it showed, it asked two different kinds of questions about different countries, about how countries create wealth. The original theory is its initial endowments, favorable climate, and growing conditions trade routes, gold and minerals, resources that you can trade with. The competing hypothesis is an institution's hypothesis, just governance. And this wonderful study of colonial intervention, this is a way of actually trying to tease out causality. So they took 400 cases of countries going into other countries as uh, mercantile systems. Either it was an extractive governance, where they took stuff out and took it home, or they argued there was a kind of a just governance for the folks that actually lived there. Why did they implement just governance in the places they lived? Well, in that case, they were the minority, so they needed to protect minority rights. The fascinating thing that happened was a reversal of fortune. Those countries that started wealthy but had these extractive governments wound up poor. Those countries that started poor but had just governance wound up wealthy. The institutional governance creates wealth. Folks are willing to invest. You avoid fraud. You actually get better outcomes in here. So in a sense, what you want to do is create mechanisms that cause folks to be willing to share their information, cause them to be willing to invest, cause the system to correct fraudulent problems. And you will get wealth creation. And that's the, that's the punchline. So uh, we, have a couple, we even have a paper on that topic. We have a couple of claims on that. So I won't, I won't bore you with that. But there were, I wanted to leave you with two ideas. One was that. Market mechanisms simultaneously can fight misuse of communication and underneath the causes underneath that. Um, and it can actually disambiguate between declared statements and truth, right? Deception versus you know, fact versus fiction in there. So use information economics to do that. And then we also want to use this idea of with a million eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Borrow this idea from computer science and from the open source movement and apply it to just governments and apply it to fraud fighting. But use the computer science ideas of scalability so that you also get this recursive governance structure to actually make growth and wealth economics happen. So with that, I'm done. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm, sure, I'm happy to stick around and take any other questions. Yeah, I know some people have time. to leave, but we can stay for another 10 minutes or so and take questions. So I think he was ahead of you, so I wanted to get, yes. Thanks. Um, about six slides back when you were talking about the jurors. Uh, yeah. uh, um, there's an eBay phenomenon that uh, the bad guys set up and to, to buy things from each other to build up a good reputation, and then once they have that good Absolutely reputation, they correct. Then, then they fraud people. Yeah. How do you deal with that in such a lot of That's a great question. In fact, I know of an example where there's a particular fellow um, 
who actually had, he had built up a reputation over the course of a year, then he cashed out by claiming he got an estate sale on all of these uh, special figurines. Um, he actually, uh, he left his wife, cashed out his bank account, and fled the country. Really interesting case. Uh, extreme examples of that are a little bit hard, you know, where someone has, um, someone has invested in understanding how the system works and are so invested they're going to take advantage of that system in its current form. That's very hard to detect. One thing I would argue, however, is that these crowdsource mechanisms are actually better than statistical methods at detecting things because they become more adaptable. Fraud succeeds partly because it keeps moving and changing the story. So if you look at spam, there have been you know, Viagra, then there's pump and dump, then there are the 419 scams, and then there are the, um, uh, and now they're using drive-bys on uh, web hosting services to infect your machine. The nature of it keeps changing. If the only thing you're doing, if the traditional mechanism is to simply look for the statistical anomalies and they change what they're doing to something else based on what your current architecture is, you won't pick it up. I'm going to argue that an advantage of a mechanism like this is you'll miss the first one because they intentionally use whatever governance mechanism you've got and try to exploit it, but you'll pick it up faster. The Bernie Madoff will have a harder time getting to the 65 billion um, under a mechanism like this than under just statistical anomaly detection. So can we solve it perfectly? I don't think so. People are too creative. It's an arms race. Whatever mechanism you design, they're going to design something to try to break it. But I'm willing to bet as with the zombie mechanism, if you can surface the detection faster and you can demotivate the people who from doing it, you make it harder. So that would be the argument. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. So what problem to you number two is the million eyeballs have to be more qualified and then buy it. Ah, yes, yes, yes. And actually there need to there need to actually another problem is there needs to be a million eyeballs. If you've got two, and you're not going to get that benefit. Right? So there's, you, you have to get enough critical mass to get a market going in order that you can crowdsource. So I, I agree with that. That's correct. And there's on a further trial pitch, one of the jurors argued this guy was guilty, especially with the mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, <that> okay. <laughs> right. I, okay. Well, that's, you know, that, the, the, actually, there's a lot of literature in political science on voting mechanisms as to when you want. So in murder cases, they're the norm is unanimity versus less critical elements for you know type one and type two errors. You might go with plurality, majority, other things like that. So we can we can move the voting mechanism based on the cost benefit analysis to try to optimize the solution. Would be would be my argument for that. So it's possible. Again, I'm not going to argue this is a perfect solution. You know, uh, nobody can actually. But I actually think you can make a great deal of progress toward making increasing what I would say social efficiency to get good results. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, are you aware of what the status might be of trying to uh, create a insurance market for providers, IT providers, uh, or actually IT users, to uh, replace uh, value lost when they have an intrusion and so forth? They I actually love that question, and it ties directly to a knowledge market for sure. I was speaking with a computer scientist, Hal Abelson, uh, about a year ago on that question. And one of the reasons the, the insurance market hasn't materialized, in his view, was that no one's been able to value the information. How do you insure something that you can't value? Insure, you know, th there's this information symmetry. Well, they'll claim it's just worth this huge value, and it re really wasn't. Um, and the insurer can't really have a good way to go after that. Ironically, as a side consequence of the knowledge market research, I go back to this, and it goes, I forget, did you ask the question on what's the point value, is it one to 10 or whatever? It's directly related to that question. So if I go back to the knowledge marketplace, uh, where's my slide on that? I'll go take to this one. Right, uh, what you've just told me from your first question, I need a floating price mechanism. Now, in this case, I've been restricted to 10 points. So if I'm asking, all right, what's this pointer in the semaphore? Maybe that's a really low value thing versus how am I going to land this business deal and then create millions of dollars? That shouldn't be worth 10 points. That should be worth 100 or 1,000 points on that. So I need a floating price, price mechanism to create a true market. Once I have that,
I add an auction market. From the auction market, I translate points to dollars, and I can now put a price tag on your information. I can now create an insurance market because I can value the information inside your system. Couldn't do that before. So I'm going to argue the way to do this is to create this market information where I'm trading at floating prices, calculate the exchange rate, value your information, we've got a whole new market, a whole new possibility. So it's another extension of the research you guys are funding. Ah, which uh, the iTunes tip is gift card is one is. Fifth. That's a great question. This is at the beginning. Okay, this is one you do have to adjust for. So you have to be careful for it. This is at the beginning of the semester. This happened later. They hadn't earned enough points yet, so it's exactly a function of the money supply. That's exactly so. The money supply is small early on. They haven't earned a lot of points, right? So it, it's inflation. The money supply is much um, greater later. That also happens at the end of the semester, the last thing up there. So they're spending all their points at the last time before they're not going to be able to use it. So look at the size of money supply. And again, adjust it to monetary policy. What's the inflation rate? So uh, and when you're just launching the market, there's very little liquidity. That's, that's the reason. That's a, that's a very good insight. And again, you can use economics to figure out what, what the inflation rate is, the, adjust, the real price as opposed to the nominal price. Maybe okay. one more. Other questions? Yes. Um, actually, I think there are ways of doing that. And this is actually having the crowd police itself. Mm -hmm. So here's a way that this might happen. Suppose, let's go again, go back to this marketplace. I'll give you an example from uh, the back on this. Right? This is where you rank folks based on their expertise points. Now suppose this person here wants to demonstrate they've got greater expertise in Python programming and try to do it fraudulently. Well, now all of a sudden the people that they have just jumped and I'm motivated, well, why did he jump me in the list? What did he do? As long as there's sufficient transparency in the system, that was one of the design rules kind of skipped over, as long as there's sufficient transparency in the system, others will be motivated to inspect, well, what did he do to actually get higher in the queue, in which case it's likely to get detected. There needs to be sufficient transparency in the mechanism that others can see, others who would be so motivated can see and then report. So that's a way of dealing with that. Okay. Thanks Thank, for coming. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming and just a reminder, uh, Marshall's going to be in room 1120 from 2.30 to 3.30.